All right, let's get into the Word. Looking forward to chapters 7 and 8 in 1 Kings. On Thursday nights, we're going through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Tonight, we are going to uh, tackle two chapters, and they're very long chapters. Actually, we were going to do this last week, but uh, we preempted it with a prophecy update because of everything uh, that had happened, particularly last Thursday during the day. Uh, so tonight we will uh, complete both of these chapters. We uh, will get through them. <laughs> so, uh, but again, I, I don't want us to uh, get muddied in the details uh, of uh, these chapters. There's a lot of detail that we're going to see here, but there's a reason uh, that it's here. So before we jump in, why don't we pray? We'll ask God's blessing on our time in His Word. Lord, thank You for Your Word. And thank You for these two chapters here that we have in First Kings. Lord, we need for You, though, as You're always so faithful to do, by the Holy Spirit, enable us to see what it is that you want to show us in these chapters tonight. Lord, we're looking to you as the author and finisher of our faith to minister to us tonight as we submit ourselves to you. Lord, speak through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. But Solomon took 13 years to build his own house, so he finished all his house. Um, just verse 1 for right now. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. At this rate, if we just take one verse at a time, we'll be here till midnight. No, we're not going to take just one verse at a time. But right here at the start, there's an interesting detail and it's not so easily noticed at first, but it's concerning this time frame with which it took Solomon to build his house. Now, we're told that it took 13 years to complete it, while in the previous chapter we're told it took only seven years to complete the temple. Now again, there's a reason that we have this detail, and the question becomes why? Now, some have suggested that it's because there was more of an urgency to complete the temple, which is why it only took half the time, seven years, and there was no hurry, there was no urgency when it came to Solomon's house. Um, others suggest, and I'm not so quick to join hands with this suggestion uh, concerning Solomon's character, but... Uh, G. Campbell Morgan in his commentary said it does show the place which his own personal comfort and luxurious tastes had come to occupy in the life of Solomon. It is often by such simple and unexpected tests that the deepest facts of a human life are revealed. In other words, we're starting to see this uh, develop in Solomon's life who has just unspeakable wealth, uh, enormous amounts of wealth as we're going to see in just the elaborate nature of the temple and his palace. Um, the reason I'm not so quick to uh, join with that uh, suggestion is because we're going to see a, a Solomon who is really in a good place with the Lord tonight. Uh, we're going to see it demonstrated in the dedication of the temple and the celebration of the completion of the temple and what Solomon does and what Solomon prays. We're going to see a very eloquent and beautiful prayer on the part of Solomon, which to me suggests that he's actually in a really good uh, place at this point in his life. We'll talk more about that towards the end of the uh, chapter 8. Verse 2, he also built the house of the forest of Lebanon 
Its length was 100 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits with four rows of cedar pillars and cedar beams on the pillars. And verse 3, it was paneled with cedar above the beams that were on 45 pillars, 15 to a row. Here's where all the detail is, and there's more to come. Verse 4, there were windows with beveled frames in three rows, and window was opposite window in three tiers. And verse 5, all the doorways and the doorposts had rectangular frames, and window was opposite window in three tiers. He also, verse 6, made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits, and its width 30 cubits. And in front of them was a portico with pillars, and a canopy was in front of them. Then, verse 7, he made a hall for the throne, the hall of judgment, where he might judge. And it was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling. Imagine how expensive that would be in uh, today's dollars, especially in Hawaii, <laughs> where everything is 10 times more expensive and takes 10 times uh, longer. By the way, it's not going to take us 13 years to build our, our building, okay? <laughs> it better not take us seven years either. It better not take us two years either. And verse 8, the house where he dwelt had another court inside the hall of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken as wife. All these were of costly stones cut to size, trimmed with saws inside and out from the foundation to the eaves, and also on the outside to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, large stones, some ten cubits and some eight cubits, and above were costly stones hewn to size and cedar wood. The great court, verse 12, was enclosed with three rows of hewn stones and a row of cedar beams. So were the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the temple. Okay, as we get into all this detail, we probably need to ask this question of why. Again, why is it important that we know this? Why don't we just, you know, kind of skip through all of this detail and get to the, you know, part that's not quite so boring? Well, we know that every word is in God's Word for a reason. For our instruction, for our exhortation, for our rebuke. And as I hope uh, we'll see here shortly, there are numerous reasons why we need to uh, study this and know this and see this detail. A couple of reasons just right out of the chute. The first of which is that to me all of this detail speaks to how God cares about every detail in our lives. I mean this is the God who numbers the hairs on our head which, you know, for some is not a big job anymore to do. <laughs> but this is a God who is concerned about the minutest of details. A second reason, I believe, is that it speaks to God's goodness when it comes to the complexity of building something as magnificent as this was, especially when the building of such a magnificent thing is set apart for his glory. You know, I think that um, as Christians we do err greatly when we think that um, God does not delight in nice things. Nice things that are for his glory. You know, I think that sometimes as Christians we tend to go to one of two extremes. We either shy away from the opulent and or we shy away from the, for lack of a better word, the schlocky. And I think there's a, a happy medium, there's a balance somewhere in the middle. You know, one of the things that I've learned over the years and am learning is that I never want my service to the Lord or that which I do for the Lord to ever be so grand on a scale 
that it takes away from the glory of God. I don't want it to compete with the glory of God. I want it to complement the glory of God. And I want it to honor God. And I want it to bless God. But I think that sometimes we go to the other extreme and we shortchange God. We poor mouth God. I hope you know what I mean by that. We, we tend to cheapen. And I don't think God is honored in either extreme. I don't think that God is glorified in either extreme. I think about the Proverbs where the prayer is offered up, Lord, don't give me so much that I forget you. But also, on the other side of that, conversely, don't give me so little that I steal and dishonor you. You know, in other words, and I think it's different for, for everybody. I think we're all wired so very differently, but I think there's this place in the middle, and God knows exactly what that place is where you are neither dishonoring God and you are glorifying God in all that you do. Verse 13, now King Solomon sent and brought Huram from Tyre. Now this is not Hiram, the king of, of Tyre. This is a different guy. In fact, uh, verse 14, he says, he was the son of a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a bronze worker. Apparently this guy was very gifted, a half Israelite and half Gentile. And we're told he was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill in working with all kinds of bronze work. Now it's important to understand that the Israelites are not gifted in this area. So we're told he came to King Solomon and did all his work. And he cast two pillars of bronze, each one 18 cubits high, and a line of 12 cubits measured the circumference of each. Then verse 16, he made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. He made a lattice network with wreaths of chain work for the capitals which were on top of the pillars, seven chains for one capital and seven for the other capital. So verse 18, he made the pillars and two rows of pomegranates above the network all around to cover the capitals that were on top and thus he did for the other capital. The capitals which were on top of the pillars in the hall were in the shape of lilies, four cubits. The capitals on the two pillars also had pomegranates above by the convex surface which was next to the network and there were 200 such pomegranates in rows on each of the capitals all around. Uh, by the way, another reason for all of this detail <laughs> um, is that it could be replicated many generations later. We would know what this actually looked like. You could take all of this detail, really a, a blueprint, a schematic if you prefer, and replicate what this would have looked like as an extension. This palace, this magnificent palace in concert with the magnificent temple close in proximity. Verse 21, then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the right and called its name Yachin. And he set up the pillar on the left and called its name Boaz. The tops, verse 22, of the pillars were in the shape of lilies. So the work of the pillars was finished. Well, that's a lot of time given to these pillars. We're even told the name of the guy, who he was, where he was from, and all about these pillars, which must have been just beautiful. And we're even told what names were given to these pillars. Now, we know that the name is the nature, and such is the case with the names of these two pillars. Yachin means he shall establish, and Boaz means in it is strength. Now here's what I'm thinking. Every time the Israelites would go to the temple, they would see these beautiful, magnificent, stunning pillars and they would have the names of those pillars ever before them as a reminder 
that it is God who establishes the work. It's only God who establishes the work. And the work that God establishes is only in the strength of the Lord. This is Zechariah 4, 6, right? Not by might, not by power, but by you in your strength, O Lord. It's the strength of the Lord. It's not the strength of man. And this needed to be ever before them constantly. And this is interesting. And again, this is where the detail, I think it ha has personal application in our own lives. But we're told that the tops of the pillars were in the shape of delicate lilies. Wow. Here's these pillars of strength and established stability. And then you got little lilies on the top. I mean, it's almost, you know, this oxymoron, this, this paradox. And the commentator suggested it that when God would look down upon these pillars, he would see the beauty of the lilies on the top of that which he had established in his strength. Verse 23, And he made the sea of cast bronze, ten cubits from one brim to the other. It was completely round. Its height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Below its brim were ornamental buds encircling it all around, ten to a cubit, all the way around the sea. The ornamental buds were cast in two rows when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, verse 25, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. By the way, this is a, there's some typology here. I don't uh, want to take the time to get into it. We really got into it when we studied the tabernacle. But this kind of has a, a glimpse of the heavenly scene. You have the north, the south, the east, the west, and you have these oxen, <laughs> and you have there in the center, and the, it says the sea was set upon them, and all their back parts pointed inward. It was, verse 26, a handbreadth thick, and its brim was shaped like the brim of a cup, like a lily blossom. It contained 2,000 baths. Try to get your mind around this. He also made ten carts of bronze. Four cubits was the length of each cart. Four cubits its width and three cubits its height. And verse 28, this was the design of the carts. They had panels and the panels were between frames. On the panels that were between the frames were, here they are again, lions, oxen, and cherubim. And on the frames was a pedestal on top. Below the lions and oxen were wreaths of plated work. Every cart had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and its four feet had supports. Under the laver were supports of cast bronze beside each wreath. Its opening, verse 31, inside the crown at the top was one cubit in diameter, and the opening was round, shaped like a pedestal, one and a half cubits in outside diameter, and also on the opening were engravings. But the panels were square, not round. Under the panels, verse 32, were the four wheels, and the axles of the wheels were joined to the cart. The height of a wheel was one and a half cubits. Verse 33, the workmanship of the wheels was like the workmanship of a chariot wheel. Their axle pins, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all of cast bronze. And there were four supports at the four corners of each cart. You're getting this, right? You're going to be tested on this next week. So <laughs> its supports were part of the cart itself. On the top, verse 35 of the cart, at the height of half a cubit, it was perfectly round. And on the top of the cart, its flanges and its panels were of the same casting. On the plates of its flanges and on its panels, he engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees. I like palm trees. Wherever there was a clear space on each with wreaths all around. Thus, verse 37, he made the ten carts. All of them were of the same mold, one measure and one shape. Then he made ten lavers of bronze. Each laver contained 40 baths, and each laver was four cubits. 
uh, one commentator calculated that this would have held about 11,500 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. And they're going to need it, as we're about to see. On each of the ten carts was a laver. And verse 39, he put five carts on the right side of the house and five on the left side of the house. He set the sea on the right side of the house towards the southeast. Hurim, verse 40, made the lavers and the shovels and the bowls. So Hurim finished doing all the work that he was to do for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals that were on top of the two pillars, the two networks covering the two bowl-shaped capitals which were on top of the pillars, 400 pomegranates for the two networks, two rows of pomegranates for each network to cover the two bowl-shaped capitals that were on top of the pillars. The 10 carts, verse 43, and 10 lavers on the carts, one sea and 12 oxen under the sea, the pots, the shovels and the bowls, all these articles which Huram made for King Solomon for the house of the Lord were of burnished bronze. In the plain, verse 46 of Jordan, the king had them cast into clay molds between Sakoth and Zeratan. And Solomon, verse 47, did not, this is interesting, <laughs> weigh all the articles. And here's why. Because there were so many. The weight of the bronze was not determined. Could you imagine just logistically how impossible it would be to weigh all of this? We have the measurements. We don't have the weight. <laughs> First of all, think about this. Where are they going to get scales to weigh something like this? Right? Thus Solomon, verse 48, had all the furnishings made for the house of the Lord, the altar of gold, and the table of gold on which was the showbread, the stands, verse 49, of pure gold. Five on the right side, five on the left in front of the inner sanctuary with the flowers and the lamps and the wick trimmers of gold, the basins, the trimmers, the bowls, the ladles, and the censers of pure gold and the hinges of gold, both for the doors of the inner room, the most holy place, and for the doors of the main hall of the temple. So, verse 51, all the work that King Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. <laughs> and Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the furnishings, and he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Okay, let's catch our breath here for just a minute before we jump into chapter 8. Uh, if you're wondering where Solomon acquired all of these materials, all of these treasures, all of these furnishings, all of these measurements even, uh, wonder no more. Uh, he got them from, in a word, Dad. Dad. <laughs> uh, King David. We're told in 1 Chronicles 29 that while David could not construct the temple, and that's going to be brought up again here shortly, it didn't stop David from collecting all the materials for his son, who he knew would ultimately build the temple. I think there's a takeaway, and we've talked about this before. Just because God doesn't call you to do something, or maybe... God has said no to you, that no, you can't do this, it doesn't mean that you can't support it, even though you're not the one is going to have do it. There's no reason to not support the work that will ultimately be done by somebody else. Well, chapter 8, now... Solomon, verse 1, assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem that they might bring up, now this is very important, the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore, verse 2, all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ithanim, I want you to hold on to that for a second, which is the seventh month. 
So verse 3. All of the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon, verse 5, and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with them were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that, get this, could not be counted or numbered for multitude. In other words, they were countless. You couldn't count them. It's like you couldn't weigh, the, you could not count them because there was so many of them. Verse 6, And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to place into the inner sanctuary of the temple. This is the Holy of Holies, the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. Stop right there. Here's what I'm thinking. First and foremost, before the table of showbread, the lampstand, the bronze laver, the altar of sacrifice, any other of the furnishings that were going to go into this grand and glorious temple, first and foremost, the Ark of the Covenant had to be placed and positioned in the Holy of Holies. Well, what does that tell you? Well, it tells me that first and foremost is the Word of God, the Law of God, in the Holy of Holies, the presence of God. This is where the Shekinah glory, which we're going to see again tonight, was. This is where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. First and foremost, nothing else matters. I don't care the pure gold, the beauty with which this was made for the glory of God, for the temple of God. It makes no difference. It matters not if the ark of God is not first and foremost. So verse 8, this is another important detail that we're given here. Uh, we're told about the poles that extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. And they are there to this day. Now verse 9, I want you to Pay close attention to this. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And verse 10, it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud, there it is, filled the house of the Lord. Ah, all right, now we can put everything else in. The presence of the Lord is there. The cloud has filled the house of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of God. So verse 11, that the priest could not continue, and this is interesting, ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Oh, what? So, I mean, the priest could not continue ministering there in the temple because of the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God, the glory of the Lord, filling the house of the Lord. Yeah, this is kind of along the lines of Isaiah, when he was so overcome by the presence of God that he just could only say, take the coal and cleanse my lips. Here I am. It kind of carries with it the idea of when Peter uh, realized that it was the Lord, and he, he couldn't even, he just said, don't even look at me. I am, I am a sinful man. It, it carries with it the idea of just the holiness of God. And when the holiness of God is so present, and it fills the, the place, it, it just brings you face to face with the reality of how sinful you are. You know, we jokingly, lightheartedly say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about thus and such, and why, and blah, 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 blah. No, you're not. 
<laughs> when you're going to be in such awe, you won't be able even to utter a sound. I mean, it's just going to, you, you won't even be able, you're just going to be beholding the glory of God before the throne of God, and you will be speechless. You won't want to talk. I, I get the impression that the only thing we're going to do for who knows how long, we're in eternity, it doesn't matter, we're just going to be praising Him and worshiping Him. Thou art worthy, O Lord, and we will be in the presence of the Lord. Oh, can it's incomprehensible. Finite cannot comprehend the infinite glory of God. Verse 12, then Solomon spoke. The Lord said, He would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. Then verse 14, the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. Can you imagine the exuberation? They have been wandering in the wilderness, tearing down and setting up, kind of like a lot of churches in Hawaii, the, the tent of meeting, <laughs> the tabernacle which was portable. And now they own their own building. <laughs> They're occupying their own building. And this is not just any building. This is the temple in all of its splendor. Can you imagine the elation and the exuberance and all of Israel, numerous. Can you imagine the numbers of the Israelites that are there standing and here's their king and he turns around to them and he blesses them and we're told how he blesses them in verse 15. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who spoke with his mouth to my father David and with his hand has fulfilled it saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. Remember we talked about how the name of God is literally on Jerusalem? Literally. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now verse 17, it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord had said, verse 18, to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, verse 19, you shall not build the temple, but your son, who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So, verse 20, the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke, and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And verse 21, there I have made a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, wow. <laughs> I mean just wow. What a grand <laughs> and glorious ceremony this must have been. Uh, we're going to see here uh, towards the end of the chapter that this goes on for two weeks. Listen, I'll tell you something. In the Middle East to this day I mean, it's kind of like the locals here. They know how to party, all right? I mean, it's not just a one-night thing. And here's the detail uh, that I wanted to uh, point out. We're told in verse 2 that they waited until the seventh month of Ethanim to do this. Now, here's why they did that. Because this would have put it on the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was to be celebrated for seven days. And then on the eighth day, and the Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration, a commemoration of how God provided a tabernacle, a place, a dwelling. It's also known as the Feast of Booths during the wilderness wanderings. And so now, how appropriate it would have been, what perfect timing this would have been to celebrate it on the Feast of Tabernacles. And here's what's interesting. Solomon waited. He waited for 11 months. If my math is right, 11 months. Now, I promise you, as God is my witness, we will not wait 11 months after the completion of our building to celebrate and dedicate our building. Okay, but Solomon does. Why? Because it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was really important that this be celebrated and dedicated on that particular feast. Well, another interesting detail is in verse 9, and it has to do with the ark that apparently now only contains the two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments, the law of God. Now, what happened to the manna? What happened to Aaron's budding rod? The last time we heard about this, there were three items that were in the ark. The manna was in a bowl, Aaron's budding rod, and then the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. So now all of a sudden we're told that the only thing that left, that remained in the ark, was only the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone. Uh, what happened? Answer, we don't really know. And we don't really know because we're simply not told. Now, I've always been taught that when the Bible is silent, you would do well to remain silent as well. <laughs> but that doesn't stop um, people like myself and other <laughs> Bible teachers and commentators from speculating as to why it is that only the two tablets of stone remain. I like how one uh, commentator uh, uh, said it. He suggests that Aaron's budding rod and the manna, the common denominator with those two was that they were miraculous signs and wonders. Now stay with me. The point he tries to make is, is that signs and wonders, they all go away, fade away. But the only thing that lasts is the law of God, the word of God. You know, we're told in the scriptures that signs and wonders follow. It's not the other way around. And sadly, in many a church today in the United States of America, the emphasis is on the signs and the wonders. And the signs and the wonders, they don't last. The one thing that does, and the only thing that will, is the Word of God. Well, let's move on quickly. Verse 22, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, verse 23, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept, verse 24, what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised, your servant David, my father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel, only if your sons take heed to their way, that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now I pray, verse 26, O God of Israel, let your word come true. 
which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But, verse 27, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. This is crucial. In other words, Solomon is keenly aware that this temple that he has built, as glorious and grand as it is, cannot contain the God of Israel. That's impossible. Verse 28, yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day, toward the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place, and verse 30, may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place here in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive, forgive. When, verse 31, anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked, bringing his way on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. When your people, verse 33, Israel, are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you and when they turn back to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this temple then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. I want to talk about that in a moment. Verse 35, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. Remember that three-year famine we read about prior with David? When they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants. Isn't it interesting that the main thing that Solomon is praying here is for forgiveness of sin. In other words, the, the thing that would be needed the most would be the forgiveness of sin. Forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to your people as an inheritance when, verse 37, there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people Israel, when each one knows the plague of his own heart and spreads out his hands, toward this temple, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they, verse 40, may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. Moreover, verse 41, concerning illegal immigration, well, sort of. Uh, concerning a foreigner, no, seriously, just, I'm, I'm sorry, that was terrible, actually. But uh, listen, um, this has to do with the Gentiles, the foreigners, who is not of your people Israel, but has come from a far country for your name's sake. This is Solomon's prayer, verse 42. For they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. And I'll add, if you don't mind, your magnificent temple that I have built. Word is going to get out. Who is like unto you? Have you seen this temple that was built to the God? Not for the God, 
No temple contain, can contain the God of Israel. No, built for the God of Israel. See, Israel was to be a blessing to the entire world. And they will hear and they will come. And when they come and pray toward this temple, verse 43, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner, the immigrant, <laughs> calls to you that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. When, verse 44, your people go out to battle against their enemy, wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city which you have chosen and the temple which I have built for your name, then hear, verse 45, in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. Now, verse 46. When they sin against you, and notice parenthetically we're told, for there is no one who does not sin. Does that sound a little bit like Romans for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It should. And you become angry with them. And deliver them to the enemy. And they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, We have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. And verse 48, When they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the temple which I have built for your name. Then, verse 49, here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. And, here it is again, verse 50, forgive your people who have sinned against you, and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you, and grant them compassion before those who took them captive, that they may have compassion on them, for they are your people and your inheritance, verse 51, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the iron furnace, that your eyes, verse 52, may be open to the supplication of your servant and the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you, for you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your inheritance, as you spoke by your servant Moses when you brought our fathers out of Egypt. Oh, Lord. God. Wow! What a prayer! What a prayer! By the way, this prayer is actually prophetic. Because as we know now, in terms of Israel's history, looking back, is that they would indeed be taken into captivity, into Babylon, and they would repent, and they would pray, and God would hear, as Solomon has prayed, God hear! and forgive, and bring them back to the land. And that's exactly what happens. But what an eloquent and brilliant prayer. Remember now, this is a man who has been given supernatural wisdom. I think it, it shows. I mean, I think you'd have to agree, he pretty much covered all of the bases <laughs> in, in prayer. He, he's pretty much thought of everything from if there's, you know, a foreigner, uh, I pray this. If Israel sins against you and they're taken captive, I pray this. And he covers everything, and God does hear this prayer. There's something I want us to notice here, and it's so important, that before he petitions the throne of God, he acknowledges God first. Before he petitions God, he thanks God. He acknowledges the goodness of God before he petitions the throne of God. Now, 
here's where I'm going with this. I, I think the acronym, I just remembered this. This is from many, many years ago. I even forgot who uh, I heard this from. But it's the acronym ACTS. A is for acknowledge. C is for confess. T is for thanksgiving. And S is for supplication in that order. When you first come to the Lord in prayer, you acknowledge Him. You thank Him. You confess. <laughs> and then you offer up your supplication, your petition. You ask Him your requests. You make your requests known. But first and foremost, it is so important that we acknowledge God for who He is, how He is, and how good He is. Verse 54, And so it was, when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord, that he arose from before the altar of the Lord, now watch this, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Stop right there for a second. I want to uh, mention something here. Um, we, we started off with Solomon standing like this, praying. Is this microphone going down? <laughs> standing like this with his arms lifted up. This was and is even to this day the posture of prayer. Now as we get to the end of it, we're told that when he had finished praying, all of his supplication, he got up because now at this point he was kneeling, but his hands were still up. Now the only reason I mention that is because the posture of prayer is sometimes, I think, dismissed in terms of its importance. I'm not suggesting that it's all important. You know, James 5.16 says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I mean, there are some times when I think we would do well to get on our knees in that posture and pray. And I, I'm not a big fan of the folding of hands the, the idea behind the opening up of the hands and outstretched arms, whether kneeling or standing, was in anticipation of receiving from God by virtue of the outstretched arms. And so that should be, I think, the posture of our heart in prayer is that expectation, that anticipation of receiving an answer to the prayer. Sometimes I think that the best prayers are prayed when we're in the car, <laughs> in traffic, especially when you're <laughs> like on the way here tonight. I um, lately have been using the, the drive time for uh, just some great prayer time, especially when I don't have any of the kids with me, which is kind of a rare moment uh, these days. And so it was just me and the Lord on the way here. And sure enough, there's always a messenger of Satan to sent to buffet me. Um, and I just, I just, I just pray. I said, Lord, would you just let this, I won't tell you what I called him. Um, <laughs> would you just let him pass me? Because my sanctification has just fled from me. I could just feel, you know, here I was just talking to the Lord, just, you know, petitioning the throne. Lord, just bless the teaching of your word tonight. Bless those who are going to come. And, you know, I was praying for Mark. And, and uh, sure enough, here comes this, this. I won't tell you what kind of a, I hope they're not here. You know what my greatest fear is? <laughs> yeah, my greatest fear is that um, the person who cuts me off uh, comes to the church that I pastor and, you know, or I, I, don't, I never cut. This is going very wrong very fast, but anyway, I, I know you're not here tonight because I uh, did get the license plate number down. Anyway, um, but I just said, Lord, you know, I mean, sure enough, isn't that how it is when you set your heart to just seek the Lord? In prayer, the phone rings, somebody's at the door, and it's always a wrong number, right? And some, I mean, it's kind of like all hell breaks loose. I mean, if anything, that should tell you the importance of prayer. Because Satan knows that prayer is the deciding factor. 
When a Christian prays, he is a defeated foe. The victory has already been won. The spoil is taken in prayer. And that's why Satan will do everything and stop at nothing to keep a Christian from praying. And sure enough, here I am. I'm on Saddle Road, and this guy is tailgating me. And I mean, he's making it really obvious. And I wasn't going slow either. And, he, and it was a SUV, and so the taillights are right in my mirror, you know, and they're really bright. And, you know, I'm trying to, you know, okay, Lord, um, praise the Lord. You know, trying to you know, just, and sure enough, uh, the Lord had him just, you know, whip out, get in the other lane, pass me, you know, cut me off, make it really obvious. I'm like, whatever, you know, whatever. And uh, then I went right back uh, to praying. Why did I share that? That was maybe a confession. I don't know. Um, I feel a little bit guilty about how I responded. Um, anyway, enough of my problems. Let's move on. <laughs> I just want you to know I have never, I have not had a traffic uh, uh, ticket in over 30, well, almost 30 years now. So I just want you to know that I'm an upstanding uh, citizen of the community. Okay, now I feel a lot better. Let's move on. Verse, I have no idea what, oh yeah, verse 45. Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, verse 56, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. May the Lord, verse 57, our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. And verse 59, may these words of mine, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day may require, that all the peoples, verse 60, of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as it is this day. Then, verse 62, the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offering, which he offered to the Lord. Get this number, 22,000 bulls. That's a lot of bulls. Right? And 170,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, verse 64, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small, you think, to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings. Verse 65, at that time Solomon held a feast, and all Israel with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt, before the Lord our God. Now here's where the Feast of Tabernacles comes in seven days, and he doubles it, and seven more days, 14 days. On the eighth day, verse 66, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel his people. I would like to think that after two weeks of celebrating and feasting that your heart, it, listen, if you, after two weeks of rejoicing in the Lord and celebrating and feasting are not joyful and glad of heart, there's something wrong with you, okay? <laughs> so that's how they left and that's how the chapter ends. And I appreciate your patience. And just before uh, we end uh, the study, I want to point out just a couple uh, last things here. First, this is interesting. This is the first time kneeling in prayer is mentioned in the Bible. I mean, and of all people, it's mentioned 
of Solomon. Solomon is the first person mentioned in the Bible that prays on his knees. Now, this kind of comes full circle to the very beginning uh, of chapter 7. And this is the reason why I can't quite join with this suggestion that Solomon wasn't in a good place at this point. I don't know how you pray a prayer like that and dedicate the temple like that if you're not in a good place. Solomon at this juncture in his life is in a very good place. But here's what's really sad, and I hate to end on a down note, but it's going to be short-lived. It's going to be short-lived. For the most part, it's all downhill from here. Solomon is yet another one of those that we read about in the pages of Holy Writ that starts off great and ends up not. He does not finish well. He's going to be led astray. He's going to lead the people of Israel away. They're going to serve after other gods and seek after other gods and worship other gods. And it is going to... Um, lead to just unspeakable difficulty and uh, chastisement from God. Well, let's uh, have you stand. We'll pray. Lord, thank you so much. Again, a lot of detail, but oh, how magnificent this must have been. Oh, the gladness in the hearts of those those Israelites that were present on that day to witness this and celebrate this. Lord, this isn't even a a minuscule fraction of what it's going to be like on that great and final day when we are with you in the New Jerusalem. Lord, thank you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.